Shabbat Shalom, everyone. In honor of Parashat Korach, I thought I'd be a little rebellious this morning. So I'm going to break all of the cardinal rules that you're not supposed to do when you are uh, giving a sermon as a rabbi. And I'll ask first and foremost if anyone is willing and able. We're going to study some Torah, so move forward. If you would like to move forward, please grab an Eight Saim and come with you. Otherwise, it's just going to be the Sydney Page supporter section getting all of the Torah study that we're doing. So if anyone would like to learn a little bit of Torah, come on up. If you don't want to move from your seats, I promise you that you'll also be able to hear the Torah from there. No worries. What? <laughs> So I'm going to start with something that my friend Steve Margolin has repeatedly said to me is the most dangerous move a rabbi can make in a sermon, and I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. And you know what? Even if the danger is you falling asleep, I think that's not the worst thing in the world. So if you need a little schlaf, go ahead and rest up for the next 10 minutes. So go ahead and get into a comfortable position. Close your eyes. or look down at your feet, whatever helps you focus. And I'm going to ask you to think about the following question. I want you to think about a miracle that happened in your life. Now, I'm intentionally leaving that question vague. So whatever your mind comes to, whatever you think of, I want you to think of a miracle that happened in your life. And I want you to try your hardest to bring yourself to what that miracle was. Try to bring yourself back into that moment. What was the context? What was the day or the night like? Was it warm? Was it cool? Were there certain smells or certain sounds that stand out? Whatever it is, try to bring yourself into that moment. And now whenever you're ready, please take your time. Come on back. And now by a show of hands, how many of your miracles involve something supernatural? Seeing an object that doesn't belong in the world or some kind of exception to the natural world. Something like the splitting of the yam soup, the splitting of the sea. Okay, see a few hands. And how many of your miracles were something human? The birth of a child, the recovery from illness, the peaceful transition, of death after suffering. Go ahead and look around the room. When it comes to miracles, we tend to think and we tend to exist within this dissonance. So I can only speak for myself, but I would imagine that when many of us hear the word miracle, the first thing that comes to our mind is something supernatural, is this idea of something existing outside of the natural order, something that shouldn't be there that somehow is existing. And yet, I mean, when we think about this in the context of Torah, we think about the splitting of the sea, we spit the, the splitting of the Yam Suf, the Sea of Reeds. We think about the manna, the manna coming from heaven. We think about revelation at Sinai with God existing in this pillar of fire and clouds of smoke. And yet, when we're asked to think about a miracle when it comes to us in our personal lives, almost all of us turn to miracles that are very human that exist within the natural order of the world, but for us are more moments of mindfulness, moments where we actually, for the first time, something clicks, and even though it's something that happens in the natural world, we realize just how miraculous it is. So I hope that everyone was paying attention when Sydney spoke, because Sydney, you spoke beautifully about this idea of little miracles existing in our lives and being able to appreciate those little miracles, and in fact, they're not little at all as you pointed out, they're actually momentous, massive moments of what miracles should be in our lives, that even though they might seem small, and they might seem like part of something that we receive every day, that doesn't make them any less miraculous. So let's turn in our Eitz Chaim, because I think that there's something within Sydney's Torah portion, something that she spoke on that we need to unpack together, because there's something very, very beautiful in here. So if you turn to page 868 in your Eitz Chaim, we are in chapter 17, Verse 16. 
Again, 868. And we're going to start reading together right where the Hamishi Aliyah begins. Chapter 17, verse 16. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the Israelite people and take from them from the chieftains of their ancestral houses one staff for each chieftain of an ancestral house. Twelve staffs in all. Inscribe each man's name on his staff, there being one staff for each head of an ancestral house. Also inscribe Aaron's name on the staff of Levi. Deposit them in the tent of meeting before the path where I meet with you. The staff of the man whom I choose shall sprout, and I will rid myself of the incessant mutterings of the Israelites against you. And Moses spoke thus unto the Israelites, their chieftains gave him a staff for each chieftain of an ancestral house, twelve staffs in all. Among these staffs was that of Aaron. Moses deposited the, sta deposited the staffs before the Lord in the tent of the pack. Now here's the verse, verse 23, where I want us to pay extra close attention to the words. Hebrew readers, please follow along in the Hebrew. See if you can pick up on some of these words, but I think that it's also present in the English translation. So the next day, Moshe entered the tent of the pact, and there the staff of Aaron of the house of Levi had sprouted. It had brought forth sprouts, produced blossoms, and borne almonds. Moses then brought out all the staffs from before the Lord to all the Israelites, each identified, and recovered his staff. And the Lord spoke and said to Moses, put Aaron's staff back before the pact to be kept as a lesson to rebels, so that their mutterings against me may cease lest they die. This Moses did just as the Lord had commanded him, so he did. Now what's interesting here, does anyone pick up on something fascinating when we go back to this, this part of the Torah portion in, chap in chapter 17, verse 23 that Sidney spoke on? Something that maybe we missed the first time we read this? Anyone? So I think that what we have here is that it would be enough of a miracle, it would be an incredible miracle in and of itself if they grabbed the staff and all of a sudden there were already blossoms of almonds and flowers sprouting from the staff. What we have here in verse 23 is that there's actually a process that takes place. It doesn't just bloom. It starts with buds, it sprouts, it grows in front of everyone. Aaron's staff actually blossoms like a tree in front of everyone. And the commentators, the majority of the commentators who read this, say that nothing actually happens to the staff until Moshe picks it up. And as soon as Moshe picks it up, it buds, it sprouts, it flowers, and then it produces fruit. This isn't a miracle like other miracles. It's a process. And while this natural order, the speed of which is probably one of the most miraculous parts here, it's not the speed that we need to pay attention to. What our commentators suggest to us is that we need to be paying attention to the fact that this miracle takes place within the natural order. That even though it is sped up, the miracle itself follows the laws of the world. And now if we look in the Hebrew, you'll see that the word for sprout or to give forth is Yigmol. And the great grammarian commentator Ibn Ezra reads this word in the context and tells us that it is directly related to another word, the word called Yigdol, which means to grow. And he goes a step further and it says this doesn't mean to grow in just a normal sense of growing. It's the same type of growth, it is the same type of development that is directly related to childhood, to the growth of a child, to the development of someone younger. And so here we have a remez. Here we have a hint towards something much deeper than we see on the Peshats or the superficial level. The true miracle our commentators show us is not that the fruit is hanging from the staff. It is the process of the fruit coming to its maturity, a process that exists in the world all around us, but through a slower and longer mode of development. The miracle is the everyday miracle 
that you pointed out so beautifully, Sydney. And the speed doesn't take anything away from this miracle. The fact that the almond tree sprouts, that it buds, that it blossoms, that it produces fruit at all is a miracle because it creates a new precedent in the world. It becomes law. It becomes true. And in doing so, it changes the world forever. In direct comparison, the miracles that exist in our lives are so momentous and so miraculous because they change us. Because they change who we are. Because they change the order of everything that we know. And instead of existing in a one-time-off bubble, like the swallowing of Korach, the opening of the earth, the fire that comes down and then closes itself up, the miracles that exist in our lives change us and stay with us for the rest of our lives. The birth of a child changes the world. The recovery from illness changes the world. A bond of friendship or a bond of love changes the world. And so we have in our text direct confirmation of what we in our hearts consider to be truly miraculous. It isn't the earth opening up and closing. It isn't the pillar of fire on top of Mount Sinai. And it isn't even the parting of the Yom Suf. All of those are miracles. They're different types of miracles. The truly miraculous, the miracles that change us forever, is the fact that these changes take place in the Israelite camp. The growth of this people after the rebellion of Korah, what the Jewish people have done since the revelation at Sinai, taking the Torah, embracing Torah, taking it throughout our history and giving light unto the world. That is the miracle. And the Israelites walking across the Yom Suf, walking across the dry ground, while there are two towers of water towering over them, the courage to do so changes the Israelites forever. And that is the miracle. For me, the miracle of my life is coming to this city, a city that I had never stepped, in, stepped foot in before coming here, and then to find the person that I was supposed to spend the rest of my life with here. It's also in coming here and finding a clergy team that works tirelessly each and every day to bring Torah, love, and compassion into this community. And the miracle for me is also coming into this community and finding not congregants, not people, but a family. A family that has been there for me when I needed you. A family that takes care of one another. A family that has celebrated with us. That is a miracle. Because those miracles are the miracles that change our lives. And the miracle of this congregation is in its history and in its journey to the future. That it has continued and it has marched on with resilience and hope despite some of the traumatic events that have taken place here. The miracle of this family, of this communal family, is that on the same bima where one of America's greatest rabbis was shot, that 52 years later, Sidney Page can deliver words of Torah on this very same bima and talk about the appreciation of seeing miracles in our lives. Lo The miraculous isn't in heaven. It's not removed from us and removed from our lives. The miracle is our growth. The miracle is our potential. The miracle is Sidney as she becomes bat mitzvah, a daughter of the commandments, the miracle is this congregation. This miracle is you and it is me. We are a miracle. And because we are a miracle, we have before us a sacred obligation to grow and to blossom like Aaron's staff. We are not a final result. We are a process. And that process challenges us with seemingly simple yet incredibly challenging tasks. The most pressing and the most challenging being that we have to bring the miracle that we are into this world to offer more miracles to a world so badly in need of miracles. And we do that by understanding that miracles are not necessarily what we think they are right when we hear them. That they're not grandiose acts left to us by the Kaddish Baruch Hu, by the Holy One, blessed be He. But mindful appreciation of every single moment of looking at the world with awe and to live lives blossoming with contagious wonder to close our eyes and to see blinding gratitude 
for the blessings that surround us and to understand, to truly understand that the most miraculous moments are those small moments, those everyday moments that you spoke on, Cindy, that change us forever. That change who we are, that change how we walk with the divine, that change how we bless this world with positive love and compassion. This is our task. These are the buds sprouting and blossoming into beautiful fruit. And so once again, let's close our eyes. Let's take a deep breath. And let's continue to blossom and to grow. Because here is our awe. Here is our wonder. Here we are. And we are a miracle. Shabbat Shalom.